Now, there's very few people in life that make a lasting impression, and there's even fewer people that have the talent to change and impact our day-to-day -day life, our spaces, our communities. Our next speaker is one of those people. She's from social sciences. She set up the Urban Clinic here at Hebrew University. I'm very proud to introduce you to Dr. Emily Silverman. So, 2011, this image, between the Arab Spring and Occupy Wall Street, Israel too was on fire. Young people started a small protest that went national. They said, what's wrong with me? I was a good student. I have a good job. I make a decent salary, and I can't afford my rent. Is it me? It's you too? It's you too? They set up tents, and on their tents they said affordable housing, and as their protests grew, they called for social justice, and there were hundreds of thousands of them. Now, I am an urban planner, and I specialize in housing policy, and I've been talking affordable housing for years, and nobody knows what I mean, and suddenly there's these tent camps that say affordable housing, and I say to them, what do you mean? And they say, tell us. How does the government make affordable housing? And I say, well, like this, and like this, and like this. And it starts with one-on-one -on -one tutorials, and then it's midnight teach-ins. And then I'm working with a group of 50 academics to put words to their vision. What kinds of housing policies and transport and land use create social justice? How do we do that? It's a breakthrough for me. A lot of us as academics, we work in a small field, and suddenly there was opportunities to make it real. And what we said it was with spatial justice. And what is spatial justice? It sounds like a jargon. I want to give you some examples. This aerial tram that you see here is a great example of spatial justice. This is not a gondola. This is not skiing. This is not tourism. This is public transport. This is public transport not in a rich city. In the city of Medellin in Colombia, you may know it for Cocaine, cocaine, Pablo Escobar, exactly, murders, crime, serious. Coming from these areas, coming from these kinds of very, very poor areas, how do I work in the city if I can't get to the city? That's where the jobs are. The cable car, it takes people seven minutes to get to a job. Crime goes down, employment goes up, the money that would have gone into jails is channeled into the transport, and that's not all. The city also takes the stations there, where the cable cars are built, and it says, let's use them for public buildings. This one happens to be a library. You may not love the architecture. It's a local architect. Some of them, there's an opera, there's a gym, and the people from the center of the city, the middle class people, for the first time in their lives, they're coming up to these neighborhoods. And the people in these favelas are going down, and they're meeting each other, and they're connecting. And Medellin today is called, is rebranded itself. There's still some crime. There's still some murders. When we were there, there were guards absolutely everywhere for the World Urban Forum. But they're rebranded as social urbanism. And I want to ask us, what does that mean if we look at Jerusalem? What does social urbanism mean when we use our resources in land to create social justice, to create social inclusion? So what about the light rail? Is that our version of the aerial tram? I mean, yes, because it connects the farthest away, both Jewish and Arab neighborhoods, into the center, gets people in quickly. Everybody uses it together, the ultra-Orthodox and the soldier and the Palestinian on the same train. And yet, and everything in Jerusalem is so complicated. Again, as an urban planner, this is the most complicated city maybe anywhere. Everything you touch touches everything else. The light rail was the center of attacks this year. There are border guards at many of the stations. And the, wall, the, tra the route of the train, in many places, traces the track of the border between east and west, with walls on either side. How do we in Jerusalem learn to use our housing and our transport and our land to support social justice? Well, about two and a half years ago, on an idea from our brilliant dean of social sciences, we started the Urban Clinic. Vered said, 
legal, the, the law school, they've got legal clinics. Why don't we in social sciences create clinics where our brilliant students can engage in the city, they can learn from meeting people different from them, they can check their theory against the real practice, we can create new theory from it, and they can be transformed by interactions with people who are different from them, but still not be drawn into the cynicism that happens all too often when you leave the university. This is our webpage. We call ourselves knowledge brokers. We create and, and broker knowledge, good international practice, good local practice, checking it against theory, creating new theory from it. Let me give you a couple of examples. The way we work, classic triangle, research students and community. Within with, with the students, we're talking the graduate students in social sciences. Particularly in urban planning, we have 154 master's students in urban planning. It's the largest program in the country. And we co-produce knowledge. Like I showed you the image from Medellin in Colombia, we took a group of 23 Israelis to there. And the, the publication that we produced was not just the academic, it profiled the best ideas of every person in images and links for what they want to see happen here. And it kept going. It's a project that has rolled and rolled and rolled. The Ministry of Housing has now adopted it, and it's turning into a national conversation about urbanism. But I want to focus on the last piece of the triangle, on the Jerusalem aspect, on community, and give you just two examples of what we do in Jerusalem. So the first one is placemaking. You know, cities often become about the buildings and the streets, and the public space, if we don't pay attention, it can be what gets left over. The spaces in between the building. And placemaking is quietly transforming that perspective and saying, how do people who use the spaces become involved in designing them and helping figure out how, what activities should happen in them, how they should be managed to work for all the users? We brought this to Israel. We brought this fantastic uh, New York-based group, if anybody knows Bryant Park in New York or the recent transformations in Broadway. We brought them to Israel just a year ago. We practically killed them every day. They were in a different place, giving a workshop here and a lecture there and trying again and more and more and more and more. We milked them for absolutely everything they had. And the best, and we did it. We did it because Israel has got a culture of rulemaking. Let's make rules. What you can build, where you can build it, how high you can build it, who you can build it for. We got a lot of rulemaking. And we got a lot of project making with this many units. Now, with, as a response to the uh, social protests, we're trying to build not the 20,000 housing units we used to do each year, we're trying to do 40,000, 50,000, 60,000. We've got here are 10,000 and here are 5,000 units. We're making rules making and project making. And we wanted to introduce a culture of place making, of working with the people who live there to make spaces that work for them. So we trotted these people from Project for Public Spaces all around the country. The best, bar none, the best session was Jerusalem. That's our mayor over there. And to my absolute shock, he said, this placemaking, this is what we need. This is about promoting creative creativity and community and ownership in the city. And we, the city, will fund resident proposals that come through their community councils we want those. Bring them to us. He said, OK. So, whoops. Here's us in action. We got, a small, we got a grant from the Rothschild Foundation to have eight graduate students uh, working in four community councils, doing little projects. We're here in, the, in this image there in the restaurant that's owned by the restaurant that's right next to one of the places where they're working. And they're taking a space that the city spent a lot of money building, and it's not working, and they're reinventing what can happen in it, together with the people who want to use it. And uh, it was a surprising success. The city says, the thing about this placemaking stuff is in contrast to planning, where you say, oh, 10 years from now, I want to see this. How do I get there? How do I make it perfect? How do I make it even more perfect? And then you do it. In placemaking, we're much easier. It's light, it's quick, it's cheap. We try something, we fail, we try something again. And that works. That builds a spirit of resilience and ownership and experimentation. We take the risk. 
These guys did it, the city saw it, they loved it, they have just signed with a contract to scale it up 10 times as much for the coming year. They're taking it over, we're working with them on a newsletter on the academic training of their staff, and they want to see a network of spots around the city in the neighborhood. It's really exciting to get to be part of that change. The last thing I'm going to talk to you about is our newest project, Urban 95 Centimeters. What does the city look like from the vantage point of a three-foot-tall person, of a three-year-old? You know, we know that the ages from zero to three are critical. The brain scientists from here tell us that the neuron connections that develop at that period, that's what is more important to their life outcomes of a child than ever so much else. That's the period when it happens. We know part of what influences that. We know parenting is important, and we know a lot about parenting. And we know that early childhood education is important, and that one dollar invested in early childhood education brings a return of seven dollars down the line in disadvantaged populations. But we also know that place matters, that the city matters, what I see when I go outside, what noise, where I can play, what the sidewalk looks like, whether my parents can get me onto a bus. And we know surprisingly little about that. So the Urban Hebrew University was asked by a global foundation on this topic to become part of a knowledge network with universities in India, Brazil, Colombia, Holland, taking us all to Harvard next year, uh, to be part of investigating how do we make cities work for young children. And they chose us for three reasons, two of which are on this page. One is that relative to the OECD average, we have an enormous share of our population between the ages of zero and three. Out the roof. And the second is we have lots of little kids and we have an incredible amount of income inequality and poverty among those kids. How do we make our cities work well for these little kids, especially those who were growing up in poverty? I said three reasons. Third reason is because at Hebrew University, the Urban Clinic can work together with the best minds that are here, whether it's in brain science or the early childhood, the Schwartz Center for Early Childhood Education or the public health people. We can work across the departments to try to figure out how do we make our cities work well for these young children. And I want to close with an image and a question. This is from Jerusalem. It's from one of my favorite spots, lots of people's favorite spots. You know, Jerusalem doesn't... Oh, I say this. How many of you think that on the world rankings of livable cities, and they come out every year, and there's a lot of critique of them, but they come out every year. On the world rankings of livable cities, raise your hand if you think Jerusalem makes the top 100. Raise your hand... Oh, you think. Raise your hand if you think Tel Aviv makes the top 100. Yeah, you're right. Tel Aviv is in that ranking and it goes up and it goes up and Jerusalem is not. It's not in the ranking of livable cities. It's a hard city to live in. I think most people who've lived here know that. But it has something else. And I don't mean just the history and the future. Jerusalem inspires passion. The spot we're looking at in this image, this was supposed to be a road and the local activists got together and they got the academia involved with them and they got the city to listen to them. They took an example from the High Line in New York. If you haven't been on the Jerusalem version of the High Line, it's called the Rail Park. Go, take one thing from this lecture, go for a walk on the High Line. It's a lovable spot. And that's what our role is at the Urban Clinic, is to harness that passion with the community planning, with the knowledge and tools that we can bring from here and from abroad to make our city more livable, more lovable, and more just. It is a great thing for that, <laughs> that Jerusalem has Hebrew University, and I feel incredibly lucky to be part of Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Thank you.